the name of Christ, amen. This morning we're going to be looking at the, our uh, epistle reading uh, text, and uh, it's um, one that uh, many of you have probably read before in 1 Corinthians 8. And uh, it, it seems to be focusing on a very specific issue of the day, which we will talk about. But the reality is that this text is talking about something that is much more generally a huge importance to our faith, to the church, to our Christian life. And this text is really, in many ways, talking about what do we do with truth? Now let me start with true story of a high school student by the name of Jeff Eritz. I know it's a, this is real, I don't know when it happened, but he wrote an essay for his, one of his high school courses about discovering truth or the idea of understanding objective truth. And this is what he, Mr. Eritz, Jeff Eritz or Eritz, came up with. He writes, whenever I get a package of plain M&Ms, I make it my duty to continue the strength and robustness of the candy as a species. To this end, I hold M&M duels. Taking two candies between my thumb and forefinger, I apply pressure, squeezing them together until one of them cracks and splinters. That is the loser, the weaker. I eat the inferior one immediately. The winner gets to go another round. I have found that in general, the brown and red M&Ms are tougher and the newer blue ones are generally inferior. I have hypothesized that the blue M&Ms as a race cannot survive long in the intense theater of competition that is the modern candy and snack food world. Occasionally, I will get a 3A mutation, a candy that is misshapen or pointier or flatter than the rest. And almost invariably, this proves to be a weakness. But on very rare occasions, it gives the candy extra strength, and in this way, the species continues to adapt to its environment. When I reach the end of the pack, I am left with one M&M, the strongest of the herd, the true and only best. This, I know now, is the best and greatest M&M of the pack. Since it would make no sense to eat this one as well, I pack it neatly in an envelope and send it to M&M Mars, a division of Mars Incorporated, Hackettstown, New Jersey, 17840, and I send it along with a, eight by, with a three by five card reading, please use this M&M for breeding purposes. This week, they wrote back to me and thanked me and sent me a coupon for a free half bag of plain M&Ms a half pound bag of plain M&Ms. I consider this grant money. I have set aside the weekend for a grand tournament. From a field of hundreds, we will discover the only true champion. There can only be one. Now, that young man is conducting a, well, one could argue, a scientific experiment to determine the truth of something. And it sounds like he's doing a good job of finding out a truth about M&Ms. But here's the thing, who cares? Uh, nobody but this guy. We talk a lot about truth in the Christian faith. And truth is very important. But 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13, gives us some insight into truth that on the surface, when we really look at it in depth, might seem to be a little bit offensive. And the first part of that is truth in and of itself is meaningless. Truth in and of itself is meaningless. How many grains of sand are on the planet? I don't know. How much money would you spend to have scientists find out? I would hope none. It would be a truth, but it would be meaningless. 
So number one, we learned that truth needs to be something that is, that is actually relevant to the existence of either ourselves or another, or it, it must have some sort of meaning, or else what's the point? The second thing our text tells us very clearly is that truth alone is no match for weakness. So we start with this idea of truth. It, we're Christians, we're about the truth. I wanna tell you and share with you the truth, the truth of Jesus. But according to our text, the truth alone is no match for weakness. Here's the situation. At the advent of the Christian faith in the first century, you had all these new, especially Gentile Christians in the city of Corinth that was primarily Gentiles, and they had come from pagan religions that worshiped idols. Now, idols are just made of wood or stone or, or whatever, and, and these people had come to know the truth of Christ, that Christ is real and living and our only hope for salvation and for eternity. And these idols are nothing. And that's why the Apostle Paul says in, in verse four, as eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. There is no God but one. In other words, there's no such thing. Idols are just foolish man-made myths. But pagans would offer food to them. Not really food per se, as much as most frequently they would uh, sacrifice an animal. Uh, you know, uh, whatever it might be, a, a, a cow or a chicken or a bull or whatever, and they would, you know, slit its throat and sacrifice it. But they didn't just throw it away after they sacrificed it. After the ceremony was over, the, the priests in the temple would sell the meat in the marketplace. It's one of the ways that the, the temple was financed. It's a good deal. Nobody had any problem with that. And it was good meat because you were supposed to only bring the best cows, the best meat, for a sacrifice in, in all religions. So this food would be offered in the market. Now Christians, many of them would just buy the meat, not think twice about it. But some of these former pagans struggled with this. And they thought ah, that meat was part of a, a cow that was sacrificed to an idol and idols are wrong and I believe in Jesus. I, ref, I will not eat that meat. And so if they're that was the only meat that was available in the market, they'd go without meat. And the Apostle Paul goes on to say that food offered to an idol is the same as any kind of food. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. However, that is the truth alone. That's the truth. Idols aren't real, and food sacrificed to idols isn't going to help you and ain't going to hurt you. It's just food. It's just meat. But then when that food, that truth, meets weakness, there's a problem. In verse 7, the apostle says, but some through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. In other words, by eating that meat, even though the truth is it's meaningless, they somehow take it in and feel they are doing something wrong. Maybe they feel shame. Or maybe like an al alcoholic, it brings up temptation and makes them want to start worshiping idols again. But when you mix that truth with the weakness of human beings, the truth alone can be useless. If those men and women that were eating that food, even though it was true, it's just meat, if it turns them back to idolatry, however, that would be horrible. So food to idols and whether or not we should eat it is like many other things in life that are neither forbidden nor commanded in Holy Scripture. Uh, what should you have for breakfast on Saturday morning? 
If you turn to your Bible to get that answer, you're gonna be spending a lot of time searching. It doesn't say. Jesus said, have whatever you want for breakfast. I mean, don't have heroin, but other than that, I mean, have whatever you want for breakfast. And we, the big Latin phrase we use for this because to make sure that, you know, pastors seem smart, we gotta have big Latin phrases for everything. We call this adiaphora. And adiaphora is simply things that scripture neither forbids nor commands. It's kind of left up to us. And whether or not you want to eat meat that was offered to an idol, it's up to you. If you do it, it's fine. If you don't do it, it's fine. However, a lot of times people and Christians of the day would get very focused on the truth. And what, it seem, what seems to be happening is that they were either mocking these people and eating meat in front of them saying, oh, come on, you're such a fool. And, and leading them astray in that way. Or maybe, maybe just the idea of making a rule and saying, how dare you say that this meat is anything but free to eat? You know, who are you to tell God what to do? And there became these arguments, these problems. And I like to refer to this as in, in my own made up uh, theological term as the adiaphora slippery slope. And our church, uh, churches as a whole, but a, a lot of times more confessional churches are very guilty of this. The Bible says to do or not do something. And we take things that we're not told about, but say, yeah, but if we did that, it could lead to the sin or the forbidden item in scripture. For example, when I was in high school, I went to a very strict, more fundamentalist school. There was no dancing. Well, why? Did anybody have anything against dancing? No. Does the Bible have to say anything about not dancing? No. But they said, but dancing leads to other things. You know, you get these young people that close together and it's all gonna fall apart. So no dances. It was the argument of slippery slope. The problem is this, the Bible gives us no authority to make slippery slope laws or rules. It does tell us that truth alone is no match for weakness. So we have a bit of a paradox. It's true, this whole issue of eating a food sacrifice to an idol, for some will cause them no problem at all, but for others could seriously harm their faith. But at the same time, the Bible says there is no rule. So what do we do? What do we do with that? Many of our churches today, what they do is they follow the slippery slope and make rules about everything. And if you look, you will see, well, we will only do it this way because if we don't, it could lead to this, which is still not unbiblical, but it could lead to this, which is still not unbiblical, but it could lead to this, which is still not unbiblical, but that could lead to something that's unbiblical. And you know what? They're right. The problem is the Bible doesn't give us the authority to do that. The Bible tells us about keeping ourselves pure sexually. It does not say you cannot dance. It would be a lot easier, wouldn't it, if the Bible just laid all that out. In fact, what would be great if God made an individual Bible for every one of us and said, I know you and your weaknesses, here's what you need to do. But he didn't. So the first step in resolving this problem is to remember that truth without humility is a lie. Now think about that statement for a minute. Truth without humility is a lie. I'm not just saying that we should be humble as we pursue truth, but that literally when, when we take truth and we do not have humility, it's a lie. Verse eight, concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. He's saying, we all know, those us Christians, us educated people in the faith, we know this is nonsense. Idols are just pieces of rock. Then he says, this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. 
Then he says, if anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. That is huge. If anyone imagines he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. Now think about that. Every time we say, I know this, Apostle Paul is saying, you don't. But wait, 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 we, whoa, uh, this is starting to sound like postmodern um, knowledge and, and truth is relevant and we don't know anything so we can do anything. No, no, no. That's not what it's saying. What it's telling us is this. I know or I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way that I will have eternal life, that his death on the cross has saved me from my sins, that I am forgiven and redeemed by his work, his work alone. I believe that Christ was fully human and fully God, that he was miraculously born, that he was miraculously resurrected. I believe all these things. And if you ask me, is it true that Christ is fully human and fully God, that Christ, is it true that Christ rose from the dead? Yes, I'll say it's true. But I'd better have some humility with that statement. It would be better if I said, I confess that Christ rose from the dead. I confess that Christ is fully human and fully God. Because here's the thing. What does it mean that Christ is fully human and fully God? I don't know. I can't comprehend that. How did the resurrection exactly work? I, I don't know. It, it, it's beyond me. How does the whole concept of, of God choosing me and God saving me, but at the same time some other people are going to go to hell, hey, how does this all completely work? I know what Scripture says and I confess it, but if I'm going to be honest, I can't comprehend it. What happened in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve were denied the knowledge of good and evil, a tree of knowledge. And Satan convinced them not to have the humility to let God solely understand it. And they tried to understand it themselves because they were arrogant and they died. Here's the reality, any truth. Let's not even talk about divine, eternal truths. What is a chair? How does electricity and sound work? How do the physics of the universe behave? All of these truths that we assume and that we know, if you really think about it, we only know a very tiny part of that reality. I was having a discussion with with, with, uh, with a well-known physicist in our congregation, Mike Lang, and he was talking about uh, the, the, what we knew about the electricity and protons. And, and, and um, the interesting thing is when we look at these core concepts that we can describe scientifically, we think we've really got some knowledge there. But if we start asking questions like, well, but why is there gravitational force? Why do particles clump together? What, why do electric, electricity and chemicals work together? Why, why does this happen? Where, why, why is there space and not something else? I mean, really the most important questions of the truths that we think we know are yet to be answered even if you have the brightest scientific mind of the century. We have to approach truth with humility because as human beings with human senses, we can only know a very surface amount of what is real and what is true. We have to be humble enough to let some things belong to God and just confess them. Jesus declared in Matthew 11, Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. 
All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Our text tells us that if you think you know something, you really don't know what you think you know. But if you love God, you are known. In other words, back in the Garden of Eden, God said, don't worry about what you know and don't know. Just hold my hand. Let me know you. Because you are not capable of knowing and understanding me. I am coming to you. So as we deal with this problem here in the time of of the first century in the early church, we have to remember that that regardless of how true something is, and it is true, it doesn't matter what kind of food you eat, if it was sacrificed to idols or not, but if we remove humility from the equation, we got a problem because of human weakness. So what's the solution? What do we do? We struggle with this in the church today where people constantly argue about things that are not explicitly stated in Scripture, but by many are considered essential for the church. Whether it's in how we worship, whether it's in how we conduct our lives. Do you remember when we were young, or many of you that are my age or older, the stigma of so many things that now nobody would even think twice about? Can you imagine somebody walking into church with a big tattoo 40 years ago? There would be, it would be, you know, an uproar. People, oh, oh my goodness. Uh, remember when people first, when men first started getting their ears pierced? Remember the, the music that was forbidden to you by your parents when you were young? And now, All of that today is considered nothing. So what was true? What was true? Well, the reality was none of it was in Scripture. It was all adiaphora. So when we tried to determine the truth of it, if that's all we were focused on is, is this true, we're in trouble because truth alone is no match for weakness. Truth without humility is a lie. The only answer is to take truth and add the gospel, because when you do that, now you have encouragement. There is truth. There is the truth of Holy Scripture, and even though those truths are only fully known by God himself, we still can accept and and confess that this is true. And we are even able to say, you know what, here's some things that aren't in Scripture. For example, uh, our, there is no scriptural blueprint for the worship of the church. It doesn't tell us, this is, there's not a bulletin in the, in the Bible. The reason we worship the way we worship, the reason we are a liturgical historical church, is we have said, look, we've looked through history and it is very easy and almost always happens that churches, if not, if not very conscious about it, very quickly turn to worshiping themselves. In their music and in, in what they do as a church, it becomes very self-focused. So we, have, as a church, find it important to stay with the historical liturgy that comes completely only from Holy Scripture and constantly focuses on Christ. Is it always exciting? No. But it does do a wonderful job, as do the hymns that have been vetted by the church in our hymnal of keeping us focused on Christ and not ourselves. But is it a rule that we should tell people? If you don't do it this way, you're going to hell. A drum in the church? Oh, the flames are going to burn for you. No. But it doesn't mean that we can't make a stand on something and say, well, this is what we believe is the right thing to do. 
but we can only do that if we have truth plus gospel. Verse 9, take care, says Paul, this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother from whom, for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest it make my brother stumble. That's truth plus the gospel. The definition of encouragement in the English is literally the word courage plus a prefix in, and it literally means to put courage into someone, to build them up. And when we stand for a truth that causes someone to fall, we are doing the opposite of encouraging them. So people come to me frequently and, and say, you know, well, Pastor Ring, you know, your, your church is a little old fashioned and, you know, and, and, and um, you know, boy, a lot more people might come if you had, you know, well, I don't know, more modern this, uh, you know, maybe a big giant movie screen and some laser beams and, and a smoke machine. I still really want a smoke machine just for no other reason than just a smoke machine. Just, just so people go, why is there a smoke machine? I don't know. We were told that would bring people to church. But a lot of people get very, very authoritative and, and, and very self-righteous about things like worship. Well, this is the right way to do things. In fact, some might look at our church as just downright, oh, you know, downright liberal. I mean, you know, I don't fold the communion cloth during communion in the shape of a cross. I, I just kind of lay it on the side. How dare I? Uh, I, have, I have been a guest preacher at churches where only the pastor was allowed to touch communion. And I thought, oh my goodness, we, we've got just regular old ladies in there preparing communion. In fact, uh, you know, there's like 20 people that know where the secret key is to the wine cabinet even. I mean, you know, my goodness, what pagans must we be? Does the Bible say who should prepare communion? No. But those others will say, ah, yes, 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 but, but you start letting that happen. If you just start letting common people start preparing communion, you're, you're going you're gonna to start eroding the office of the holy ministry, and you're going to start the, it's a slippery slope. Could be. Could very well be. But there is no slippery slope argument in the holy scriptures. What we're given is truth plus gospel. We stand by the truth of scripture, and we add to it love. We add to it love. As Paul says, to the weak I become weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel. That's what truth must be in the church. Truth alone is worthless because human beings are too weak for it. The truth must contain the gospel. Another way of saying it, as, as the Bible states it, speaking the truth in love. So if you feel strongly about something, and we have many things that we do feel strongly about, we must stand firm in our truth. But if we stand firm in our truth without love and kindness, with looking out for the weakness of those that we are sharing that truth with, we might as well be lying. Because we are not, we are not building up people in Christ. And according to this text, it makes us a sinner against Christ. One of the most wonderful, uh, to me, 
stories of, of, of the New Testament is the relationship of the Apostle Paul and John Mark. In Acts 15, 37, after the early missionary journeys of, of the Apostle Paul with Barnabas, they're about to go on another one. And we're told that Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company and Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. Now, Paul was right. I agree with them. The gospel, sharing the gospel, the proclamation of the faith, especially at that time. I mean, Paul is risking his life every day and would eventually end up in prison and, and being killed. And somebody that just bailed on him, somebody that cowardly ran away, we're here for the gospel. It's not about Mark, it's about the gospel. I would have agreed with Paul. I would have said, no, we need people that are going to stand firm. I would have been right there with him. What he said was true. He was right. Have you ever, like me, found yourself saying that, but I'm right? Have you ever found yourself telling your wife that? I'm starting to learn that that's not wise. But I was right. No. Look at 2 Timothy 4, 9, where the Apostle Paul in prison, depressed, tired. He writes, do your best to come to me soon, speaking to Timothy, for Demas in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. But then this last part is what I love. Get Mark. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. The same guy that he said in full rightness and truth, this guy's a coward, he's a quitter, not going with us. Toward the end of his life, this is the one that Paul is saying, please, I need my Mark. I need my loyal companion." Was it true that Mark was a deserter? Yes, but so what? The truth alone without the gospel is useless. Because here's the other truth, you're a deserter. The other truth is you're a sinner. The other truth is Christ knew you when he died for you. Christ knows you every day and he sees in you the ugliness. He sees in you all the lies. Do you ever wonder what outsiders think when you often maybe tell the story that you've created that makes you feel okay with certain aspects of your life? Like why maybe there's something going on in your family or why something's going on in your job or your relationships or your finances or your failures. We all tend to try to come up with ways to soften that. But you know that most people that are outside of you often see through that. But imagine what Christ sees through. Imagine what Christ sees in your heart. Imagine how ugly it is. That's the truth. But then there's the gospel. Christ took the truth and added, I love you. I love you despite the fact that you're a mess. You know what? I love Mark despite the fact that he failed. And the gospel is about forgiveness, a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. And that is the only way that human beings can successfully have truth. This issue of eating food sacrificed to idols may not be in its exact form today, but it is still ever present every day. There are things that we, in our hearts, know to be true, but that truth is actually causing us to sin because of the way we are using that truth with other people. We need to remember 
how Christ used the truth he found in us. He died and rose and forgave. This morning I encourage you to know the truth of Christ. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Don't create doctrines of slippery slope that are not biblical, but just a human attempt to prevent sin. But instead, take the truth and tuck it in with the gospel. It's the only kind of truth that human beings, that Christians, can actually hold. Remember the truth that Christ has seen in you. Take the truth that has been handed to you as a precious gift and use it likewise. In the name of Christ, amen.